Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenny Brown, and I am the founding partner of Brown and Dutton Law Firm in Marietta, Georgia. We practice primarily family law. And with me today, I have my friend, Amy Getz. Hi, Amy. How are you? I am so excited to be here. Yes, I'm so Let's excited. talk about money. <laughs> yes. Um, and to, I usually see you in person, but today we're virtual, which is totally fine. That's right. Um, but Amy is a CPA. She is with um, IRC Wealth, and she is also a financial advisor. And something that we're going to talk about today and try to really focus on is financial independence and what that looks like for each person, whether you're going through um, divorce, whether you're you know, a young married couple or a single parent. And so, Amy, could you just take a minute and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your story and um, you know, your clients? Tell, just give us a little background. Yes, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super grateful to be here. So like she said, I'm Amy Getz. I am a financial advisor with IRC Wealth. I'm also a CPA because in my former life, I focused on accounting and I'm also a certified divorce financial analyst, which is just someone who helps negotiate the financial, um, the financial territory of a divorce. And so I work for IRC Wealth, but I'm also, I like to say the billboard for them because I've been a client for over a decade. That's how I came to know them. Um, I was a stay at home mom for over a decade as well. I had three kids in four years. So now I am the proud mom of three teenagers. And at some point I decided it was time for me to reinvent my career. And being a financial advisor was a beautiful gift handed to me by the CEO of IRC Wealth. It completely aligns with my values and who I am. I not only walk the walk, I talk the talk or, or however you wanna go opposite that, but I have been working my own financial plan for a very long time. And it is um, absolutely what I believe in and what I teach and what I hope is for everyone. I truly believe um, wealth and financial freedom are for everyone. And I think people sort of struggle with that concept. And as someone who spends her life in finance and money, it is possible for you. It's possible for all of us. And so I would love to just make sure that that message is shared, that financial freedom is for everyone. And even more importantly, I am an advocate of women for sure. And I do believe wealthy women change the world. So I think we need to start having the conversation about money and profits and recognizing that when money is in the hands of good people, great things happen. Yeah, definitely. And I think that one thing that I want to address just from the onset is the elephant in the room, right? People mm -hmm. don't like talking about money. I mean, it's something that I have to talk about with our clients day in and day out because it's such a fundamental part of divorce and custody and all of that. But in regular life, people don't like to talk about money. They ignore it because it's a stressor or they just, it's a taboo topic. So how do you start to overcome that hurdle of getting comfortable either with your spouse or with a professional about talking about money? I love this question. I love this topic because I feel like what we need to do is normalize money. I think people also need to recognize their limiting beliefs around money and where those come from. Um, a lot of times we subconsciously adopt the beliefs of others, specifically our parents or caregivers, and we actually look at the language and the behavior that was modeled in our childhood, and we tend to adopt those beliefs. But when we actually sit down and really look at our limiting beliefs around money, we recognize that they're they, they often aren't true. For instance, you know, you have to work really hard to be wealthy. Well, I would argue that the folks that are working, you know, fixing our streets in the middle of the summer heat, they're working really, really hard. And those aren't necessarily the most financially successful people in our world. And so I just want people to really take a moment and analyze their limiting beliefs around money and recognize that it's okay to talk about it. I think as you know, we had briefly chatted before, people think about money and finances as like the monster under the bed. And they make it out to be such a huge deal in their head, something that's not okay. But really we all know when you turn the lights on and peek under the bed, there's never really a monster. So it's really just about being honest with yourself and recognizing that knowing that information is powerful. It's and it's also just feedback. It's just the ability to help you make a great future choice. And to speak to financial independence as well, I wanna say, yes, if you're a single person, you, you need to be aware of your numbers. But if you are a, someone with a business partner or a romantic partner, finance is a team sport. It's really a conversation that needs to be had between people that are financially connected. And I think oftentimes 
especially women, tend to abdicate their role in the financial world. And I want to encourage women to take a more active role and really start to understand those numbers and what's happening in their personal finance with their relationships and themselves and take some ownership of that as well. Yeah, it's interesting because what you said is so true that we take so much of what we believe about finances from our parents and whether we adopt and mirror them or whether we go the total opposite way and try to be nothing like them and then you're on the other side of the spectrum, right. it's, you're learning from your experience and your spouse or whoever you are you know, trying to partner with is learning from their experiences, which are totally different from yours. So not having, you know, that same understanding creates a huge problem. Um, and it's one of the, you know, one of the biggest factors that ultimately lead to divorce is that different uh, belief on what is acceptable with uh, money. But another thing that I think a lot of people think is only rich people can invest, right? So I have to have all of this excess money, or I don't, qualify, like I'm wasting my time talking to a financial advisor or I'm wasting their time. Is that true? I mean, do you think, oh, you have to be in this category to invest? Absolutely not. And I love to shake this myth up because I think people have, like you said, the idea that if I don't have you know, four or five or six figures to invest, then it's not worth it. And what I would argue that it's absolutely important for you to start somewhere. And I recognize that we're in all different financial positions in life. But what I would also say is everyone has the opportunity and we can start as small as taking $20 a paycheck and starting to put that away in a savings account. Eventually that money keeps growing. And what I think is more important is that it allows you to start to prioritize yourself and your financial future. And I think that's the bigger gain from starting to invest in a small way is recognizing that you are putting yourself first in the role with money. And I think what happens is, is I love for people to start investing and we can, you know, maybe get into this future in the future in a little bit later, but you know, a financial plan, a spending plan, people start to, you know, quiver when I say budget. So I don't, because what I want to talk about is the ability to look at your number look at what's coming in and look at what's going out and anything that's in that's left i want you to consider to invest that money and i say that because i also want you to consider making it an automatic investment the number one way that i see people grow wealthy in my firm and the clients that i work with is that they've set it up so that it is mindless they set it up so they are investing in their 401k that automatic transfers are happening into their savings account their investment account they're automating their savings because that is the quickest way to become a millionaire is when you just take it off the top and recognize that you're going to live on the difference. And I think as Americans, we tend to make more, spend more, make more, spend more. And what I would encourage people to do is to really look at their lifestyle, be comfortable with their lifestyle and recognize that when you make more, sure, enjoy a little bit, but start to save more as well. It should actually feel a little bit like a stretch. I mean, I don't want it to be painful and hurt, but it should be a little bit of a stretch. And as Americans, as humans, really, We'll tell ourselves, we'll save what's left over at the end of the month, but it just starts to seem like everyone is energetically aligned to spend what's in their checking account, and it never actually makes its way over when you're doing a manual transfer to the savings. So I would encourage people to automatically set up saving amounts, and you can do multiple ones. You know, I have one that goes to a house emergency fund. I have one that goes to just a general cash savings fund, one that goes to an after-tax brokerage account in addition to my 401k. And then I love to squirrel away money. So I'll even have like a vacation fund, you know, set up at my savings um, account, those sorts of things. But when you start to put money away, you start to get comfortable with it and you almost don't miss it. And so start somewhere, but start um, making it a stretch. And then and when that gets comfortable, add a little more to it. And that's how you're going to grow your wealth and have it not be a painful, I guess, journey is what I'm trying to say. When I think one thing that you and I have talked about before is that um, we're going to stick with spending plan because I actually like it better than budget as well. Everyone um, does. <laughs> but people don't know where their money goes. And it's not an income thing. It's not even an education thing. I've had clients that make $50,000 and I've had clients that make $500,000 a year. And, and the story remains the same of as far as dollar per dollar, people don't know where it goes. And so really sitting down and figuring out 
just what you said, like what is important to you? If, if Starbucks is important to you or if nails are important to you, you don't necessarily have to not do those to invest. You just have to fit that in to your plan and have a plan of, okay, I'm going to do this, but the plan is not, hey, what's ever left, I will uh, put away because there's nothing left. Just like you're saying, and we spend what we have. I absolutely agree with you. And I think people need to focus on what brings them joy. I always like to say, if it doesn't bring you joy or money, then really, why are you doing it? So focus on what brings you joy. And if you're the person that loves a Starbucks in the morning, put that into your spending plan. That's not maybe what brings me joy. And I don't do that, but that's what brings you joy. And you have to be happy in your life. I don't want anyone to live on the quote beanies and weenies diet to get ahead. What I want you to do is live within your means, add some things in that bring you joy, but then also evaluate your other spending to say, you know what? I'm wasting my money over here. I don't actually use the gym membership or really going out to eat isn't a big deal for me. I just have, haven't made a priority to cook. I like to cook. So it's really sort of reallocating the things that bring you joy, looking at your numbers. It's taking the mystery out of it. And it takes maybe, you know, 30, 60, 90 days of tracking it. And then you start to get more comfortable. But as we have talked about, people oftentimes have no idea how much they're spending on things that are frivolous, that um, they just, it's routine. And I think it take charge of that and give it an evaluation. I'm not saying track every penny for the rest of your life. What I'm saying is to get a handle on where it is. And I would encourage you to do this maybe once a year, maybe once a year at a period of time, certainly not around the holidays. That's a different you know, period of time, but track your spending. It sort of is a reset. It gets you back on track, but you have to prioritize your savings in your spending plan, in addition to the things that bring you joy and your fixed expenses. So if Starbucks is your thing, you know, I love some nails. So that's factored into my spending plan. I love travel. I have a vacation travel fund because that's important to me, but that's not more important than saving for my future. So that's also included in my spending plan. So the typical client that, or the typical, I guess, situation that we see is very often, um, whether you have one working spouse or two, you're going from one household to two in a divorce, a hundred percent of the time. And so you might've had two incomes in that house, but you only had one house, or you may have had one, but either way about it, you're doubling your expenses with the same amount of income. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, um, what would you say is the biggest tip to people who are really going through that transition of how do I start to prepare for my future beyond, you know, just knowing that, I'm getting out of the situation, right? What, what are the first steps? What can they do? What would you suggest? Um, so actually my first suggestion is to really recognize that the space that you're gonna be in is temporary. It's not permanent. So it might be a little more difficult in the beginning as the transition happens, but just recognize that that's not where you're gonna be in two, three, four, and five years. So honor the place that that is stressful, that is new territory, but also remind yourself that this is only where I'm starting. It's not where I'm ending. Um, I think, again, we've said it several times, but it's important to know your numbers. It's important to recognize. And when I'm counseling someone who's in a divorce situation, I actually talk to them not specifically about the period of divorce, but what I try and get them to do is to get in the mindset of looking at what is your gonna life, life going to look like after the divorce. That's where I want to talk about your spending plan. Do you see yourself living in an apartment or buying a house? Do you see yourself um, you know, working full time? Do you see yourself adding in something else? It's really sort of looking at where you want to go and sort of stepping past the emotional piece of the divorce, because let's be honest, it's one of the most traumatic things that people go through. But I'm to come in and to say, look, I understand that if this is hard right now, let's look past this to your future and really talk through those numbers. And I think too, I want to encourage people to recognize that you do need to enjoy, how do I say this nicely? I want you to, right, to be able to enjoy feeling like you have a new lease on things. But I find that oftentimes people will get through divorce and then their spending can tend to get out of control. 
And I would encourage folks to really look at why that's happening. And maybe there's some counseling that needs to go on, whether it's with a financial advisor or a therapist, really to talk about why you are now overspending to sort of make yourself feel better. That is one of the pitfalls that I see. And I want to encourage folks to recognize that spending more money isn't actually going to bring you the joy and happiness that you're seeking. But um, look at what you're doing, look at the life that you want, and let's start to build a plan that focuses on that life. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, definitely. And something that you said, as far as looking where you want to be, not necessarily focusing on what you are or where you are. And that's the same way that we counsel our clients in a totally different arena. But uh, look, what does your, we focus on what's your new normal going to look like, right? How can you get through this situation and co-parent post-divorce and have a relationship because even though you're not going to be married to them, you still have kids together, right? So how are we going to do that? Um, But it's kind of the same idea for the finances of, look, let's look at where you want to be. Like what long-term goals do we have and how can we start getting there? And I think you mentioned that earlier of you don't have to have an extra thousand dollars a month. I mean, if you're putting away $20 a check or $25 or a hundred dollars a month, if it's automatic, you're probably not going to even know where that money went. I promise uh, you're not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it builds. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it adds up. Um, I, I think actually people's ability um, to look at things so immediately, right? Like even, even as a financial person, the, 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 the invention of the cell phone and people being able to have real-time information um, is good and bad, you know, specifically as we're talking about being in the market. Um, you know, when the market goes up and down, that's just an offer to buy and sell. If you actually haven't sold, you're not losing anything, right? So it's the same with your, your numbers. Like, fix it and forget it to an extent. And I'm not saying bury your head in the sand, but when it comes to savings, like until it starts to feel a little more comfortable, don't look at the number, right? And then when you start to recognize, hey, I just automatically do this, check out that number, see the growth that you've had and add to it. The goal is to always continue to adding to your savings. And I think back to your point of speaking with a financial advisor, I think no matter what your income level, it's always a good idea to get financial advice. And I often say to people, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. If your car is not working, you go to a mechanic. But people feel like if their money situation isn't working, that they can't actually speak to a financial person. I will happily speak to anyone. Not everyone is an ideal client for me, but that doesn't mean I can't offer you some sort of advice to get you to where you are an ideal client for me. Um, And I've seen people who've never made more than a hundred thousand have a significant savings for their future financial freedom because they prioritize that and made choices that aligned with that. But I've also had, like you said, people who make half a million to a million annually and have less than six figures saved for their future. So it doesn't correlate to your income. It correlates to the Um, amount of like what you focus on grows. So if it's important for you to have that security and financial freedom, regardless of your income level, you're going to get there. Yeah. I always find it interesting because just because you make money does not mean you have money and people have this misconception of, oh, they make $200,000. Like they have all this money. That is not the case. It's Um, really not. It's, it's not, it's shocking. Sometimes you see people come in and you're like, you know, you make $50,000 a year and they could have just as much in savings and retirement as someone who makes four or five times them per year. Yeah. And and to speak to that too, in terms of, you know, looking at your life post-divorce, I would also encourage people to sort of put on their blinders for a temporary period of time and not really look at what's happening with their peers. I think we are used to seeing the sort of magical life that social media presents or you know someone's driving a fancy car or they look a certain way and what i have found is sometimes those are the people that have not managed their money as well as others so it's it's a matter of just recognizing that it's what's important to you and not really to look around i always like to say listen it's not about keeping up with the joneses because the joneses are in debt 
right? It's about, it's about focusing on your house and your financial house and recognizing what's important to you. Cause that may or may not be important to the peers around you, right? They may be more comfortable with a lot of times people think, well, I'll just make more money. What I have found is that is the case when they're young, but when they're in their forties and in their fifties, they start to get tired and they recognize that they miss the opportunity to save when it was so much easier to earn that income. And we're playing catch up at that time. So I would encourage all of, especially younger people, don't wait until you feel like you have money to invest to start investing. Again, it goes back to those small amounts. Just start somewhere, build that muscle and continue to increase those amounts. When it's, there's always an excuse, right? It's always. like, I'm young, I don't have kids, I can spend all my money and traveling, I don't have obligations. And then all of a sudden it's, I have young kids, I've got to spend, they're going to get cheaper and then they get more expensive and then they Damn. are driving kids. And so there's always a life uh, excuse always. of always. why it's not a good time. But then you wake up and you're retiring and you don't have what you need for that long-term uh, plan. So one thing I want to make sure that we cover is long-term investments versus get rich quick. Okay. <laughs> so in the news, we always see these uh, articles, right? Because it's newsworthy oh. of somebody bought um, a, into this stock and they made so much money. And to me, it's, it's pretty much the same as, oh, this person won the lottery in Florida. Um, and that's not you. Okay. That's not the average person. So talk a little bit about why it's important to stay in the market, what that looks like for people, uh, to understand why it's important to prepare to leave your money there. Yeah. Oh, I love, I love, love, love this question. Um, and I can tell you as a financial advisor and working with tons of clients, most people, are just steadily investing and earning. Most people don't inherit tons of money. They don't win the lottery. They don't, you know, hit it big on, you know, cryptocurrency. It's just a matter of steady investing. And I'll I think those cryptocurrency to me and cover my ears. <laughs> I think those news stories are so um, exciting because it's really a matter of luck. It is kind of like winning the lottery. And what I would encourage folks to do is to consider that, and I, I love to say this, it's not about timing the market. It is about time in the market. And I, I want to really push that point home that we encourage people that are investing with us to have a long-term mentality. If you feel like you're going to need money in the next three years, investing it in the market is not your best option. Just at that point, leave it in cash. But when we um, are investing money for clients, we're looking at a five, 10 and 15 year, if not further out big picture, it's not about in and out. And I think there are some people, and if that's your jam and you want to have an account and do your day trading, that's fantastic. But it's gambling at that point, when you are looking at your investments as I'm going to hit the next big one, that truly is looking, it's sort of chasing the high. Um, and I just think, if I could really push home one message, it's about leaving your money in the market. It's and, and working with a professional, you know, we have people on our investment team that all they do is monitor stocks, check for when it's a good time to buy, when it's a good time to sell. And I want to encourage folks to look at the market as that an investment and know that there are people that can help you and that their life's work is doing that. So unless you really are invested in researching and knowledge, maybe day trading isn't for you unless it's in a fun money account. I like to call it, you know, fun money, but I, um, I want people to also realize that, you know, the market is volatile. I mean, every year there's a market correction of at least 10%. And you know what financial advisors do then? They buy because things are on sale. Look at it as that. Like we are happy with a market correction because it always turns around. It's just a great opportunity to buy. And what I tell people is when you're looking at the market up close, it's going to be volatile. It's like this. But when you step back and look at that graph on more of a 10-year basis, year over year over year, the market is trending upward. The only day the market is completely going to crash to zero is when the apocalypse happens. It's just there's too many companies in there. 
And sure, it's also terrible when you have one company that absolutely goes down and never comes back. But that's equally as rare as that one company that jumps up, you know, into the tens of thousands and stays there. So I just time in the market is what's important, not timing the market. Yeah. And I think to not be driven by fear. Oh, so people yes. are, um, are afraid. I mean, and, and we even, I had this conversation with my husband, we were looking in the, uh, you know, our, we had uh, some IRAs that just plummeted. Sure. And we had that conversation of, well, do we take the money out? And we both decided like, what do we get out of that? Because that's our worst case scenario, right? You take this money out and then it's lost. Um, and sure enough, now it's higher than it was and we left it there. But how can, what would you say to someone who is that person who's afraid, right? Who's driven by fear and then they put money in and they take it out. And it seems like they're always just pulling, I mean, obviously they're pulling it out at a low every time. Yeah, I would actually encourage you to talk to someone who's well-versed in the financial world and have them educate you on how the stock market works. So many people, literally no one in our firm pulled their money out of the market last March, thank God. But we spend a lot of time educating our clients about that long-term focus. But I actually heard stories of friends who did completely cash out of their investments at that time. And if you look at where the market was at the low in March to where it was at the end of the year, there were significant gains that were made. Unpredictable for sure, but significant gains that were made. So what I would encourage folks to think about when you are selling because the market is going down, like you said, you're selling at a low, so you're not actually going to really earn the gains that you've probably had. But in addition to that, um, you are, you're, you're living in fear. And what's happened is when the market goes down, because again, I lost, you know, several hundred thousand in my accounts at the same time. But what happened was I didn't sell. So I didn't actually lose. The only time you realize a loss is when you actually sell and accept the loss. If you look at the market as people making a bid for buying and selling, if you don't accept the bid to buy or sell, you haven't actually recognized the loss in your account. So think about it like that. And unless you sell, yes, your account has gone down, but it has the opportunity to go back up. But when you pull your money out of it and sit it in cash, you're guaranteed a loss. So consider it in that sense. Don't don't live in fear. And I would say that not just with your money, but with life, you know, that's when, when you're driven by fear, you're making emotional choices and those aren't always the most rational. So educate yourself, speak to someone who is versed in it and have them offer you some comfort at that time. We had lots of conversations with clients, but no one actually pulled their money out because we had been educating them all along about the value of being in the market and recognizing that risk isn't loss. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and there's always a, um, there's always, it's always that time, right? And so if you look over the history of, you know, the worst time in history, they're like, oh, this is unprecedented. It's never happened before. And it actually has happened over and over and over Several again, times. It's a different set of facts. So absolutely. If it's yep. a war or if it's a new presidency or, or if it's, it's a real estate crash or yes. all of the things, if it's the gas prices, you know, 72, 2000, um, you know, 2001, 2008, there's all, there's other times in history. And I think an interesting t statistic is that the very, very top of the market in 2008 and the very, very low of the market in March. So you bought at the worst time and you sold at the worst time, you were still up 50%. And yeah. I think people don't recognize that it's, again, it's dollar cost averaging. It's putting money in over time and eventually that will all pay off. Yes, for sure. Um, last question, what yeah. is the favorite, what is your favorite thing about what you do and educating people on finances and a financial advisor? What's your, what's your favorite part? What is your joy? My absolute joy is specifically, I love to work with anyone. I love to work with women who feel like they don't have financial power that they don't know. And when they come in 
and they work with us, you know, watching their shoulders kind of come out of their ears and start to relax and have them know that their financial future is secure is literally the joy for me. I had a woman who, and I've told her this actually, that was a client of ours that was going through a divorce. And um, she's the reason I went and got my certified divorce financial analyst um, certificate because just watching her just load lighten brought me such joy and realized that I am giving good back into the world. I will say this as a side note, you know, I don't sell insurance products. I don't sell fear. What we do is manage your assets and we sell hope for your future. So we're paid to manage your assets. We're not paid for financial plans. We're not paid for commission-based products. And that to me is also where I feel like I live in my integrity because I'm doing just exactly what's right for the client and helping them grow their wealth. Um, so I think it's, and, and it's the fact that I've, I'm living proof. I have worked my own financial plan. I've literally done every step that I'm advising others to do and seen it change my life, which in turn changes the generational wealth of my family. And I think to me, that is super important changing generational wealth um, is changing lives. And I don't take that for granted. And it is a beautiful gift that I get to help people through those limiting beliefs around money and help them create a better future for themselves and their family. Awesome. Well, Amy, thank you so much for your time today. I think it's so important that we talk about money, that we talk about money publicly, that People get more comfortable uh, with talking about it and feeling comfortable with educating themselves and, and knowing when to say, I don't know what to do. I mean, I learn new things all the time and I'm in a profession that deals with money day in and day out. And there's all the time, I'm like, I've never even heard of that. So I don't think, I think that people need to recognize, look, you don't know at all. And if your plan is just putting money in a savings account, there's so many other things that you could be doing um, to help you, your family, your future, your children, all of that. So I appreciate your time. I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you. Um, I will be obviously sharing your information so anyone can reach out to you, but thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I've had an absolute joy being here. It brought me joy. So it says it's a yes, right? <laughs> Yes, it's a yes. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Amy. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.